Thank you, Rosalind. And uh, yes, I join you in welcoming everybody to an exciting um, new year of the Islamic Art Circle. Thank you uh, to everybody who has um, already paid their subscriptions. And uh, I encourage everyone who hasn't uh, to think of doing so soon. Uh, we are starting off with a bang, with a, with a wonderful um, speaker who um, has not uh, ever lectured uh, to the Islamic Art Circle before. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Khalid Fahmi, uh, who is the His Majesty Sultan Qaboos bin Said Professor of Modern Arabic Studies in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cambridge, uh, where he is also the Director of the Center of uh, Islamic Studies. Uh, he joined uh, Cambridge, uh, he has taught at Cambridge uh, since 2017. Professor Fahmi's specialization is the social and cultural history of the Middle East in the 19th century, with a special interest um, in his native Egypt. Professor Fahmi holds degrees from the American University in Cairo. Uh, he and uh, Rosalind, I may add, are proud alumni then of the same institution and Oxford. Uh, and he has taught at the AUC as well as Princeton and uh, New York University. Khalid Fahmi is the author of numerous books, book chapters, and articles, but from many of them, um, there is one name that keeps popping up, uh, and that is uh, the name of Muhammad Ali. Uh, it is this person who holds the key to the subject of tonight's lecture, which is based on new research of Professor Fahmi. So with no further ado, um, I would like to uh, welcome Khalid Fahmi to the Islamic Art Circle to lecture to us on the Kulie of Mehmet Ali Pasha, or Muhammad Ali um, in Kavala, Greece. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, thanks, uh, Rosalind, and thanks, uh, Doris, uh, for introducing me to the amazing uh, Islamic art uh, circle. It is a, indeed a, a privilege and a, a pleasure for me to speak to you tonight. Um, and to share with you um, my uh, passion for uh, this, uh, um, uh, this topic and this period and the person uh, that we'll be do uh, dealing with, uh, Muhammad Ali or Mehmed Ali, as I prefer to call him for reasons that I hope will become obvious uh, for all of us uh, tonight. And I want to talk about his kuliya, um, his complex of buildings in his hometown of Kavala, uh, Greece, um, and uh, it um, it is. Oops. Uh, it is this um, uh, building. This is an aerial view of it, and uh, what I want to do today is to um, talk about the history of this building and its um, meaning. Its meaning. Uh, for Mehmed Ali and its meaning for the inhabitants of Kabbalah and its meaning for us as, um, as historians. I'm not trained as an architectural historian or an art historian. I'm a social historian, but I've been working with uh, Muhammad Ali for many years now. And um, uh, it's really him that I am interested in and his acts, including acts like building, uh, this amazing uh, structure. Just to give you an idea of the scale and the location uh, of the building, um, it's in Kavala. This is the building here at the bottom. It lies, uh, this is a building, a picture taken from the port, looking up uh, on a peninsula um, and looking up towards the uh, Byzantine fortress that uh, was uh, rebuilt by the Ottomans. This, I think, was rebuilt in 1452. And um, it's this complex of buildings at the bottom here that we will be talking um, about. And um, again, this is another view of Kavala. This is the, um, the old town of Kavala. This is the peninsula we're talking about. And uh, there are a number of structures that I will be talking about today. Imaret itself or the Kuliya, the complex uh, here on the right. 
uh, the aqueducts uh, that used to obviously transport water to the city, but also to this building and the fortress as we see here. And then at the background is a very important island, the island of Thassos, uh, which plays an important role in the, our story. Uh, the guy we're dealing with is Muhammad um, uh, Ali, Mehmed Ali, um, uh, the governor of Egypt for nearly half a century or for less, little less than half a century, for 43 years. Um, and um, uh, in, uh, from 1805 to 1848, uh, then he died in 1849. Um, um, uh, the the story the, the building itself has a uh, has a long uh, and uh, checkered history. Um, this is a picture of it from 1910. Um, uh, there's a legal dispute uh, between Egypt and Greece. We can talk about it in the Q and A if you're interested. Um, but I want to limit my comments to the early part of the history of this building and specifically um, the, uh, the founding moment of this, uh, of this building uh, and throughout the reign of Muhammad Ali, you know, the, the subsequent 35 years or so. So more or less until 1848. Again, just to highlight how checkered the history it was, the building fell in disrepair um, throughout the 20th century in particular. At one moment, it even became a refugee center and uh, people squatted in it. Um, and then um, in uh, the early 1990s, uh, someone came to the rescue. Uh, in particular, this person, this woman who is herself from Kavala, uh, a resident of Kavala. And she visited uh, the building and she saw the grandeur of it, but also the sorry state uh, in which it had uh, fallen. And she decided to do something about it. And um, through um, repeated visits to Egypt and specifically to the Egyptian Awqaf, um, uh, administration, uh, Ministry of Awqaf, because the building belongs to Egypt and belongs specifically to the Ministry of Awqaf. She signed uh, a contract uh, with them uh, in 2001 to start renovating the building. And let me just show you some pictures uh, of the before and after of what uh, the building used to look like, different parts of it and how through very careful uh, renovation and restoration, uh, the building um, is now uh, considered to be uh, among the best examples of restoration of Ottoman buildings anywhere in the countries that used to belong to the Ottoman Empire, including, um, including Turkey uh, itself. It's very, very careful. Um, a restoration that um, basically transformed the building uh, into um, the magnificent uh, structure that we see it now. It's now transformed into a hotel um, and there are talks about various other things uh, that uh, can be done with it. Now, um, the questions that I want to ask are the following. When was it built specifically? Um, what function did it fulfill? Um, and how do we read it um, as historians? Um, in answering these questions, I am deeply indebted to these two studies. Um, on the left is a um, pioneering work, um, this book here uh, by Keith Lowry and Ismail Eronsal, uh, Remembering One's Roots. Um, Mehmed Ali Pasha's of Egypt, Egypt's links to the Macedonian town of Kavala. And on the right, a very important book by Ibrahim Bayoumi Ghanim, Awqaf Osirit Muhammad Ali. Ibrahim Bayoumi Ghanim is, is, is one of the prime experts in Egypt on waqf and the fiqh of waqf. Um, and uh, he had written about Awqaf 
in general. And this is his most recent book. It just came out this summer. And in it, there is a chapter on uh, the, uh, the waqf of, of Kawala, uh, the Kavala waqf, and specifically of uh, Imaret. Now, um, um, before I delve into the building itself, a brief history of uh, Muhammad Ali himself, the waqf, the Indawa, the founder of this uh, building. Um, and uh, uh, bear with me for a couple of minutes when I, of course, uh, this is something as Scott mentioned, I've been working on Muhammad Ali for many years and I can talk about him for a long time and I want to limit my brief uh, summary to the episodes in his career that touch on our story. So Muhammad Ali uh, was actually born in Kavala. Uh, he arrived in Egypt as a young man. Um, uh, um, there's an interesting medallion uh, that was struck in Egypt um, on the occasion of the building of the Nile barrages. It's a very important medallion because it cites in Hijri dates the date of his birth, uh, 1184 uh, Hijri, which is 1770 to 1771. This is interesting for uh, all kinds of things that you, it, we can talk about. Why there is a, a question about Muhammad Ali's birth date. But this is another uh, story. He in Kavala, um, up to the age of 30, when he moved to Egypt, he was not uh, a famous person. His family is of humble origins. Um, and interestingly enough, he uh, did not go to school. Um, so um, his uncle, however, his maternal uncle was most probably the governor of Kavala. His father, um, was a yol arasa, which means a night sentry of sorts, or the, uh, the guards of the roads. Um, it's not a, a very f um, a respected military rank. Um, most likely, his immediate family uh, was, not, uh, was not wealthy or uh, prestigious. And there are stories that he was uh, a troublemaker. Um, um, not a thief or a gangster or a highwayman, but maybe uh, the strong man of the, maybe counting on the uh, reputation of his uncle, occasionally taking the law in his hands, really a troublemaker. And the story goes that um, it is because of this that his uncle wanted to try and pacify him somehow and get rid of him maybe. And the occasion presented itself when Napoleon invaded Egypt and the Sultan is looking for an army to expel the French from Egypt. And uh, they were recruiting troops from the environs of Kavala and Muhammad Ali joins these groups, these troops, and he ends up uh, in Egypt in 1801. 1805, through a complicated set of circumstances and maneuvers and intrigue and internal fighting, he ends up establishing himself as the single most powerful man in Egypt, to the degree that the Sultan in Istanbul finds no other man than him, even though he'd never set foot in, in Istanbul, to appoint as governor of Egypt. So it's a very peculiar position because the governorship of Egypt is usually given to someone trusted from within the imperial, not household, but um, uh, from within uh, uh, the capital. So for someone like him to end up uh, being governor of Egypt is not very, uh, uh, very uh, common uh, to say the least. This is 1805. The second, the following stopping uh, point that I'd like to stop at is a very famous or infamous incident, the uh, massacre of the Mamluks. Um, this is an interesting episode, and this is a very interesting painting. This is on Vernet's painting in 1819, which disturbed Muhammad Ali very much. Um, we can talk about uh, this. He's concerned about his image. And he's concerned that this is shown in the Salon of, Fer of Paris of that year. Um, and um, uh, the second uh, stepping sto uh, uh, stop that uh, I want to stop at is 
how he, from 1811, this event happened in 1811, the painting uh, is in 1819, uh, sorry, 1819 is the, paint, the date of the painting, the event itself is 1811. Um, uh, the Greek war of independence or the Greek revolt against the Ottoman Sultan erupts in 1823, uh, 1821, and then 1823, Muhammad Ali joins um, as, uh, uh, sorry, before then, and a very important part of our story is the rebellion of the Wahhabis in Arabia. Uh, the Sultan still doesn't have enough troops. He is calling on his governors to help him quell this rebellion. Muhammad Ali answers the call of the Sultan and sends his second son, Tusun, to fight the, uh, the Wahhabis. Um, and then uh, some years later in 1823, Muhammad Ali fights another war on behalf of the Sultan, this time against the Greeks in their war against the Sultan, um, something that he was involved in from 1823 to 1827. 1831, another turning point, this time he turns against the Sultan, he invades Syria and fights the Sultan, his, uh, his sovereign, uh, ruler, um, defeats the Sultan's army four times, ultimately resulting in a, a huge international crisis that um, draws in the British, the French, the Austrians, the Russians, uh, and the Hungarians. Um, and eventually, Muhammad Ali, as a result of this intervention, uh, ends up being uh, recognized as the hereditary ruler of Egypt in 1841. Uh, all uh, previous fighting were now forgotten between him and the Sultan. And in 1846, now aged uh, 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 77 years old, he goes to Istanbul and on his way to, for the first time in his life, and now he's the most important, most famous man in the empire after the Sultan. And on his way back, he stops in his hometown of Kavala and, he's, uh, uh, and he visits the Imarat. Uh, two years later, he suffers from dementia. He's uh, replaced by his son, Ibrahim. And then the following year, he dies. This is a brief account of the story of Muhammad Ali. Uh, now, I want to concentrate on this episode of what Tusun had done in Arabia. The Wahhabis had captured Mecca and Medina way back in the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 17th century, the beginning of the 18th century. As I said, the Sultan doesn't have troops to regain the holy sites. This is an enormous blow to his reputation. The Sultan is the protector of the two holy sites. He loses the two holy sites. Muhammad Ali returns them. I'm sorry. Uh, this is the, I should have mentioned, the, the, this is the extent of Muhammad Ali's expansion. I'm sorry. Uh, I should have mentioned this uh, earlier. And we're talking about events that took place here in 1813 is a key date. Um, because in December of 1812, uh, Tosun captures Medina. Uh, in uh, February of 1813, he captures Mecca. These are the documents. These are very important documents um, uh, preserved in the Egyptian archives of this enormously significant uh, um, event. Um, the, Mecca, the ulama of Mecca thank Muhammad Ali for getting rid of the heretic Wahhabis. Al Khawarij, uh, Al Maraka, Al Mariqin, uh, it's called, uh, they're, they're named uh, here. Uh, and then he sends his third son, Ismail. His first son is Ibrahim, we'll talk about him later, or maybe not. He sends his third son to uh, Istanbul to hand the keys of Mecca to the Sultan. This is uh, a letter from Ismail, a young man at that time, telling his father that the Sultan appeared in person 
and took the keys of the holy city in person, which is very rare uh, occasion, because it's not just any keys, it's the keys of Mecca. So it's an enormous uh, prestige. And it is this huge favor that Muhammad Ali does to his sultan that starts our story, because also I thought, uh, because then um, I found many, many documents between Muhammad Ali and his agent in Istanbul, a man called Muhammad Najib or Mehmet Najib, um, his kapu kathuda, kathuda um, that is his agent, uh, a very powerful man, very influential man in, the, in Istanbul, the founder of many works of him in his own right, founder of many libraries in his own right. He is also the governor of the Royal Mint. He occupies many important positions, but one of his most important positions is that he is Muhammad Ali's agent in Istanbul. With the enormous wealth of Muhammad Ali, this guy bribes people left and right. And Muhammad Ali, this is not an original letter. This is an Arabic translation. This is why I'm jotting in my own handwriting with the uh, Gregorian, with the uh, yeah, Gregorian dates here. It's a photocopy that I made of a translation. Um, so uh, telling him that I want the island of Thassos to be given to me. On, and, and why don't you work on uh, helping me uh, uh, get, uh, get that? This is in 1813. The idea is I will get the island of Thassos, transform it into Waqf, and with the proceeds of this Waqf, I will then found a charitable institution in my hometown. This is the gist of many other letters between Muhammad Ali and uh, his uh, agent. Um, and um, other letters, this is uh, another one uh, a few years later in 1819, um, the early construction of the building taking place of the school and now an imaret. An imaret is a soup kitchen. Um, uh, and here he's telling again his agent, Mehmed uh, Najib, uh, his, his name is here, Najib Effendi, um, saying that now that the school has been founded, the Sultan had authorized me to build an imaret. I want, uh, the, uh, want you to authorize Khalil Agha, the governor of Kavala, to oversee the construction of the, uh, um, of the building. This is what I had argued in my short biography of Muhammad Ali, basically. That Muhammad Ali, having succeeded in getting rid of the Wahhabis and returning the holy sites of Mecca and Medina to the Sultan, he now has the right, or he thought he had the right, to ask for Thassos, the island of Thassos, which is not a small island, very wealthy because of oil and because of honey, uh, to be given to him. And with the proceeds of that island, he would build and construct this enormous uh, building. That is the sequence that I thought um, lie lay behind the story of uh, the building. Until I read Heath Lowry's uh, book. Um, uh, Heath and uh, Ismail uh, Ewan Sar's book. Um, um, and it's a fascinating book. It's really a very detailed study of this building and it's the documents and the inscriptions on the building um, that uh, inform this uh, study. Uh, Lawi and Eron Sal um, are asking important uh, questions. They raise important questions that I have to admit evaded me. Um, first, he, they say that unlike other works, this building of Mehmed Ali is not surrounded, it does not surround a mosque um, like other works traditionally, um, especially educational institutions, madrasas surrounding an already existing mosque. It's not unique, but it's fair. Um, secondly, there are no revenue yielding activities like shops or caravanserais or hammams that typically, again, uh, establish a waqf of that size. Uh, thirdly, and most intriguingly, Muhammad Ali himself, as I mentioned, is illiterate. 
Um, and yet he founds, as we will see, not only one, but a mul multiple educational institutions, edu institutions that are really only educational. So how did he get the, you know, what is the connection between founding, what, what value did he have, um, they ask, in founding these, uh, this complex of educational uh, institutions? Um, it is easy to argue that he wanted to give back to his fellow Kavalans what he had lacked, education. So he's giving them an opportunity, the poor of Kavala, which is what the Waqf uh, is about, um, something, um, uh, something, to, uh, uh, something that he had lacked. We will add a number of other questions that they ask in a minute, but I want to add one also question of mine, which is an architectural question because it is uh, the fact that uh, this is one of the earliest buildings that Muhammad Ali built. Uh, in fact, it is only the second. The first building that we know he had built is uh, um, his mausoleum, Hosh uh, al in uh, the Imam Shafi'i uh, Cemetery in Cairo. Now, this is very interesting and it has a clue. Um, uh, this building, I found a document uh, dating, dated 1809, in which Muhammad Ali is saying that, uh, let us start constructing a mausoleum for the family. This is enormously significant. The date is enormously significant. So 1809 is only four years after he had arrived in Egypt. He's still a nobody. He hasn't even got rid of his rivals in the Mamluk massacre of 1811, more importantly. By building a mausoleum, he's obviously saying that I am here to stay. In fact, I'm here to die. So um, this building in its own right is significant. Um, and I haven't studied this building and it's, it has some of the most amazing funerary tombstones. And of course, tombstones are funerary most amazing tombstones and, and funerary poetry uh, on the tombstones in the Ottoman world, in all Ottoman history. Um, um, at the, the same time, he um, also a bit later, at the same time of constructing his imaret, he built um, this uh, Sabil. Uh, his son Tusu, the guy who captured Mecca and Medina died of the plague suddenly when he went back to Egypt in 1916, very, very young. Muhammad Ali was devastated. He built this building in memory of him. This is a building I personally worked on in its restoration. We see the before and after. Uh, this is very close to Babzuela uh, in Egypt. And then Ismail, his third son, was also killed uh, in a very tragic accident, incident in Sudan. Uh, and he built this other building, which is now a museum for textiles in Sher al Moiz, in uh, in Cairo. Um, he built it in 1828, six years after uh, he died. So this is as far as contemporaneous architectural uh, acts of Muhammad Ali uh, that he built. Now, obviously, what we see here is that all of this is done in uh, in Ottoman style, Ottoman Baroque uh, style. There's no concession whatsoever to the local, as far as Egypt is concerned, Mamluk um, style. In fact, um, as to go back to the Emirate, um, uh, uh, Lowry and Erwin Sal make the connection that this might have been the inspiration uh, and in fact, the architect whose name we do not have might have been one of the uh, students of uh, uh, the Bashmimar uh, Mehmet Tahar Aga, who built uh, a very similarly looking uh, 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 mosque in front of the, um, uh, the Gulhana Park in Istanbul. Uh, now, uh, but 
Heath's um, uh, question, uh, Heath Lowry and, uh, oh, sorry, and Aaron Sal's question, uh, question, raised various other questions apart from who the architect is. Um, they um, do amazing work to try and document the different stages of the building in order to understand its meaning. And in doing so, they um, rely on the Waqfiyya. Uh, now the Waqfiyya, um, there are, uh, the original of it is in Egypt. This is a copy in Istanbul. This is the first page of it. And there are many, many uh, zales, uh, codices uh, to it. So this is one important source uh, for uh, their information. We have also a fascinating letter by Mehmed Ali uh, to the Sultan. This is, these are very rare letters. The, uh, Mehmed Ali does not write to the Sultan just like this. He writes to the Sadr Azam, he writes to other people. To write to the Sultan is a very rare, rare occasion. This is a letter, a long, long letter in which not only is he expressing thanks, but he's mentioning very important details. He's mentioning details that we are lacking. He is saying, first of all, that he's appreciative of a mulk nama humayun. It's an ownership deed that the Sultan gave him of the island of Thasos. And he's also referring to a um, firman of, uh, 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 the, of recognizing the Waqfi. Uh, now, the interesting thing that this firman is lost. And the details of the deeds with which Tassos is given is contested. The big question that we are still not clear about is whether Muhammad Ali was given or Mehmed Ali was given the property ship of Tassos or, also, or only the use of rights the right to collect taxes from it. Um, so this is one big uh, question. Um, uh, and then uh, we have um, many, as I said, uh, codices, zayls, um, additions to the Waqfaya. Uh, this one is 1843, that give very, very detailed information about the number of the students, nearly the number of calories, but the, the food that they are to be given, uh, the clothes that they are to be uh, given, the, uh, the teachers, the salary of teachers, and the enormous administrative structure of this building in terms of the muezzins, the scribes, the sweepers, the gatekeepers, um, and also who the students are, um, how to reward the students when they memorize the Quran, how to entice students to join um, the um, calendar, the Muslim calendar, what to do on Ashura, what to do on Laylat al-Qadr, what to do on Ramadan, and um, in, in, in very, very detailed codicil, this one uh, in particular. In addition, what uh, Lauri and Ronsal do is they read for the first time uh, the uh, dedicatory plaques, the inscriptions, the kitabas. Uh, there are five of them. Um, and like all famous um, kitabas, uh, Ottoman ones, the last uh, verse, the last stanza is a chronogram, which is very important because then not only do we have the date, but we also have the chronogram uh, that can give us uh, the date of the building. Um, or is it, there's another chronogram embedded, uh, embedded here. Um, so the question is, are these the dates of the buildings and the construction of this phase, or are they the dates of the plaque itself, of the inscription itself, of the writing itself? 
there's a debate about, um, about this. The conclusion of uh, Lowry's and Ehrensal's work um, is this. This is uh, an overview of the building and I have divided uh, it. The first um, uh, courtyard built was here. And then this is the second courtyard built in 1820. And this is the third courtyard uh, here. Uh, and much later, administrative building was added in 1864. Two things are worth mentioning here. First, you can see the structure is very complex. This is not just one school, this is a number of schools. There is a madrasa, which is a seminary, you know, an advanced seminary. There's a maktab, you know, a kutteb, uh, what we call in Arabic a kutteb, what in Turkish is called a maktab. Um, it, uh, and a maktab subyan or subyan maktabi, which is a primary school. There is a darshane, a lecture hall, that many observers thought it was a mosque. It was not a mosque, it was not a jamia, it was a masjid. Um, there are 60 rooms um, uh, surrounding it. Um, and interestingly, in a, third, in a second stage, there is a muhandis khana, a, an engineering school uh, added which actually was here and it was it is now destroyed uh, in, in 1924 or 26, I can't remember, when the street here was uh, widened. Uh, so they destroyed uh, a, a mosque that was on the other side, uh, not part of the complex, but also a, the Mohandas Hana here. And then the the the, the the last stage is the imaret itself, which was built in 1820, the soup kitchen to feed those students, but also to feed um, uh, the poor of other uh, institutions outside uh, the, uh, the complex, but in Kavala. Um, and uh, although the functioning of the school did not start except in the 1840s. So it's a complex building. The interesting thing, the most interesting finding of, um, of uh, uh, Lawi and Eron Sal is that the first phase did not start after receiving the Firman of 1813, but had already taken place. So Muhammad Ali had already started building his school, his complex, as early probably as 1808, and had finished already the first phase when he had the, when he got the Firman, uh, when his son did what he did, and when he got Thassos, either as usufruct or as monk. So this is a uh, this is a conclusion that he flowery reached com uh, by contrasting the wakfayas with the inscriptions uh, on the kitabas. So it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating research. The school, according to their calculation, had the capacity to house and feed uh, 274 students at any one time, 180 uh, in the, uh, the madrasa, the seminary, um, 70 for the Sobyan Maktabi for the primary school and 24 in the engineering uh, school. Now, there is a question again, people didn't realize that there is an engineering school. They only thought it was a religious seminary, advanced religious seminary and primary kutab for the memorization of the Quran, a Maktab. But I found uh, corroboration of this in the archives when I managed to find the, a register citing the books that were dedicated as waqf uh, to the uh, Kutub Hana, to the library. Um, these are two pages. Uh, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't photocopy all the pages, but um, these are mostly the titles. I've identified the titles. The titles are mostly books and grammar books and uh, history books. But 
the last page um, that give a fascinating uh, summary of how the books are donated as well, which is something we can talk about. Um, you can already see some books here, uh, geography, um, trigonometry, uh, so there were books of for the engineering school uh, dedicated uh, as waqf. Uh, this is a very important daftar um, and it's dated 1847 and the importance lie and you, is, you can see this is not just any deed. Um, this is a very, very serious uh, enterprise. This is Muhammad Ali's finance minister going in person to Istanbul to oversee the purchase of these books, then he takes them and delivers them to the first, second, and third librarians of the institution in presence of all the dignitaries of um, the, the city, the governor, the mufti, um, and uh, he's the mufti, um, and this is Mudir Qada uh, Qawala. Um, so it's a very important uh, occasion. Um, so I want to end um, by saying something about what does this mean? What does this building uh, mean? Um, uh, um, Heath, Lowry, and uh, Ismail Eronsal are making the argument that this is Muhammad Ali showing to um, his fellow Kavalans, that he had made it, that he um, is no longer the ignorant young kid that he might have once been. Now that he's actually now, uh, he's wealthy, he's rich, he's powerful. Uh, so this is probably convincing. They make another argument that I also now believe in because I did some research on this building. You remember the picture we showed at the beginning of the aqueduct? Now the aqueduct here, this has a very interesting date, which is 1234. Uh, now this aqueduct is an ancient uh, building that had again fallen into disrepair. Uh, and here Muhammad Ali is uh, repairing it. Um, and I found the documents about the repair, again, in the, uh, uh, in the archive. Serious attention given by Muhammad Ali to the repair and the finance of the, uh, the aqueduct. The aqueduct had been built by uh, Ibrahim Pasha Makbul, later Maktoul, when Suleiman the Magnificent uh, executed him. Um, uh, and he is uh, not of Kabbalah. He comes from uh, uh, another town, Praga, in further uh, west on the Albanian, close to Albania. And this is his mosque, now turned into a church. Um, this is what Pashas do. Pashas invest uh, in charity works, uh, most often in their hometowns. And this is what uh, Ibrahim Pasha had done in, in, in Kavala. Um, he was the governor of Kavala. He, was, he also came to Egypt um, and fixed its finances and later became the Sadrazam of uh, the Ottoman Empire under Suleiman. Uh, the Magnificent. So I think Muhammad Ali is saying, I am another Ibrahim Pasha. I am a Pasha. Uh, and later on, he also uh, leaves his mark on the city in other ways. He builds a mausoleum for his father, now destroyed. He builds a mausoleum for his mother, also now destroyed. The tombstone, however, is now transferred to his his home, his uh, um, house, and his house himself, itself. There's a controversy about the house. Most likely this is not his personal house. Most likely it's the house of his pater maternal uncle um, because this is a magnificent building and his parents uh, were not that wealthy by any means. The interesting thing is again, another dedicatory plaque that refers to this house as uh, Again, a waqf that belongs to the, the town. Uh, most likely, Muhammad Ali actually on the way back from Istanbul in 1846, when he stopped in his hometown, he actually purchased 
this house and made it his. Um, basically, um, uh, basically, this is uh, what this building, uh, the Imaret, uh, uh, then uh, there's another picture of, um, of his house. This is what this building then uh, means. And this is what I will conclude with. Um, in my biography of Muhammad Ali, I basically divide his life into various stages. He's someone who ruled for many years. He's a much more complex person. Let me add a personal story, uh, 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 remark here. I've been working with him for 20 years. And I now admit that I cannot figure him out. He's way, way more subtle, more intelligent, more um, perceptive than I have ever uh, imagined. I'm now working on an Arabic translation of the book and the book now is twice as long as its original English. Um, and I have come to realize, as I said, how complex he is. Um, he started as a thug. This is the first stage, his thirties. He goes to Egypt when he is 31 years old. He becomes an Egyptian ruler. And that is a big transformation in his life. He becomes a politician. He doesn't use his hands. Um, and then with especially the um, Greek war, he becomes deeply embroiled in Ottoman affairs. He's a very important Ottoman player. Uh, he's an Ottoman Pasha. And then in the last stage of his life, he becomes an international statesman. On par with Metternich, with Guizot, with Palmerston. In some respects, more intelligent than them. In some respects, ahead of them. I know this is a big claim, but I have read his letters. They are, he compares himself to Napoleon. And he says, I will not be reduced to what Napoleon had been reduced to. I will not be exiled. And he manages. This is late in the 1840s. In this period, at a very early stage, he has the power and the vision to say, I am a grand pasha. I am not on par with the Sultan, but I am without even now, he's not in, in Kavala, he's in Egypt. He's making this enormous gesture to the Ottoman world, not only to the world of Kavalans, but to the Ottoman world to say, I am leaving my mark on, uh, uh, on uh, the Ottoman world. And this is the way I do it. This is what Pashas do. And I am a grand Pasha. And uh, this is my, my, the proof to it. And we end here. Thank you, Khaled, very, very much for um, a spectacular combination of history, documents, um, and inscriptions, um, and, and architecture. It really um, sheds a new light, especially for me, uh, on this, this whole period, and it makes me want to read the expanded version, uh, or the latest version, uh, although my Arabic is not up to reading twice something that's twice as long as, uh, as the English version. Um, while uh, we ask, we wait for people to, um, uh, to write questions in the Q&A, if you do have questions, please write them. Um, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to ask the first question. First of all, um, I would like to um, also ask the audience uh, to keep the questions brief. I will try to do the same myself. Professor Fahmi has already lectured for several hours before this lecture today. So we um, are very grateful to him for agreeing to give our inaugural lecture, but also we don't want to keep him away from his uh, mentholated spirits or whatever is waiting for him uh, next. My question uh, is something that faces all of us who deal with documents and buildings, especially waqfiyas, these endowment deeds. Uh, the numbers, of course, that the Waqfiya <laughs> gives for the students, um, uh, when you look at the, uh, the actual building and its layout, there's quite obviously not enough place for all of these students. So 
do we think that there would be students lodging with families in Kavala? Do we think that this is just a sort of estimation of, you know, to, uh, to uh, inflate the prestige of the size of the thing in the document? Do you have any insights? I'm sure you've read many Wakfiyas. My experience dates from many earlier centuries, but do you have any sort of general comments or even specific comments about this problem we have uh, with Wakfiyas and buildings? It's a fascinating question, thank you. Of course, the 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 uh, the big question is how act, you know how, how can we read the building from the wakfi? Um, uh, we have um, we have accounts also. We have travelers' accounts who visited the building and who um, uh, commented on the students and what the students do um, that they are actually not learning anything. Um, <laughs> Um, so this is one point. The second is that we do not have any famous person who graduated from the school, who went to that school so that um, we can then say what the Wakfeya had planned actually materialized. Um, more specifically, I mentioned, uh, I mean, of course, I think you're not, I think, I agree with you that from the map, that we saw, there's no way that this building can sustain um, 274 students at any one time. Um, however, there is this section that was uh, destroyed, uh, a, big, a big part of the uh, Mohandas Khana uh, was destroyed. I'm sorry, I, we have a photographs of it, but I didn't include it and I should have. Um, the, the rooms, um, a, depends on how many students can fit in a room. Um, the initial phase was for 60 rooms. Um, the Wakfaya said two students per room. Uh, so that makes 120. Again, it's way less than, you know, it's less than half the total number that is mentioned uh, in the, in the Wakfaya. Um, so uh, th there is a, a um, uh, I think the, the way I personally read, read the Wakfaya is that this is an indication of the Wakif's intention. Um, what happens is, this is an important question because not only with regards to architecture and architectural history, but um, uh, I didn't mention Ibrahim al Bayoumi Ghanim's book, uh, the one on Waqf. Uh, he is an expert on Waqf, and he's an expert on who comes to it from, I have to say, explicitly an Islamist perspective. This is a magnificent system that we once had, and we no longer have it because of state encroachment on it. The, of course, the problem is that in the actual management of the Waqf, uh, that's another story. What actually happened um, and the um, uh, whether the Waqf's intentions were carried out uh, requires a different kind of research. Um, and I um, should say that uh, I didn't include um, in this presentation the enormous amount of documentation that I got on the Waqf of Thasus, or the management of Thasus. This is an entire archival unit in the Egyptian National Archives. This is a huge store of documents, let alone the documents about this Waqf in the Egyptian Ministry of Awqaf, which is what Ibrahim al Bayoumi Ghanem worked on. This is now the administration. It's politics, it's money, it's about oil, it's about pirates, and it's about embezzlement, it's about local rebellions, and in a certain case, murder. It's, uh, all of this deviates from the rosy picture painted in the Waqfaya. So my short answer, well, actually it's not very short, <laughs> is that the Waqfaya, I read it as an indication of what the Waqf intended, not what actually happened.
you're muted. Thank you very much. A, a big topic uh, that uh, deserves um, more discussion at another time. You have a question from Michael Denton. Do you think Heath Lowry's view that Muhammad Ali exaggerated his, in inverted commas, humble origin uh, is correct? That is to say it, that his background wasn't really that humble and that he wasn't an orphan, et cetera. No, um, uh, Muhammad Heath Lowry says, and I agree with him, that Muhammad Ali um, um, manipulated his past. Muhammad Ali gave many interviews to European uh, visitors. In these interviews, um, he did um, two things. He said that his father died young and that he was basically raised as an orphan, which is not true. His father died when he was a teenager. Um, and if not in his early 20s, I can't remember exactly. And um, uh, secondly, he, um, uh, he, he makes a point to say that he had done it all by himself. Um, and, um, and, and this is why I included the medallion. He also uh, says that he was born in 1869, um, in 1769, the birth year of Napoleon. <laughs> when that's not true. So he, he, was, he manipulated that, but, um, but I don't think he, uh, I agree with Heath Lowry's assessment that um, Muhammad Ali did not underestimate his humble origins. Um, he, he exaggerated the, um, the difficulty that, uh, that he uh, might have um, suffered from, um, but I don't think he came from lofty backgrounds. Um, uh, he, his parents were not particularly wealthy. Um, they were not destitute. But um, so I agree with uh, with Lowry in his assessment. Thank you. Um, there is a question. The next question is from Cleo Cantone. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I want to ask if there is any evidence of orchards for providing produce to feed the residents or ornamental gardens. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, um, I think there were no ornamental gardens in the Kulia itself. Um, the orchards were in Thassos, but that is not where the students would have gone, if that is what the question is. Uh, there is, uh, as I said, the documentation about Tassos has an enormous amount of information about the island for at least 70 years. And through that documentation, one sees evidence of all aspects of economic life, beehives, oil presses, the port, um, the woods, uh, but also orchards. Thank you. Uh, another um, Thassos related question. The title to Thassos, whose assets were these before the grant? The Sultan's? How rare is it uh, that a Fermon in this period is lost? I thought the question would be how, how rare is it that the that a Fermon of that to that effect is issued? This is a fascinating set of uh, uh, intriguing questions. Um, it's very, very rare that the Sultan seeds uh, an island so wealthy uh, at that period. And that is why in Muhammad Ali's letter that I showed you, he makes a point in, in, in referring to this and in saying something very interesting. He's saying, uh, this is um, given to me. This is not in the reward to what I have done because what I have done is actually much more costly than what I will get in return. And he, he, um, he, so he makes this point and 
then there is the question of the lost Firman. What we have is a Greek uh, translation and an Arabic uh, copy. Uh, the, the Arabic copy is something that uh, Ibrahim Ghanim uh, says in his book, page, right? Because I just read it yesterday, 26, I think. He actually says he saw it with his eyes in the Egyptian Ministry of Waqf Archive, an Arabic original contemporaneous translation into Arabic of the Firman. And the Firman is a Firman of, it's a, it's a title deed. He cedes mulk, not uh, muqata, not the right to collect taxes. Um, there's a big controversy in the 1890s and the 1900s within the ruling circles in Istanbul as to where the original Firman is. And a lot of what we know of the original Firman is a result of scribal interrogations and investigations at the behest of the Sadr Azam in 1892, 1893, to look in the, in, uh, on the Ottoman archives for the original Firman. So it's very rare to, for it to disappear. And there is a, an argument that it disappeared because there is a legal dispute between the Khediva family and Istanbul about it. Sorry, I'm muted again. The final question comes from none other than, than Elizabeth uh, Kifoden regarding the donation of books for the Waqf. Um, is there surviving evidence of any local orientation of the library's collection? This is something that um, um, uh, Anna Misirian is working on. Uh, there are, every now and then people um, uh, come and say, we have some of these books. Um, and then they make uh, ludicrous claims that there is an original uh, Mamluk uh, Quran and, um, and things of that nature. Now, uh, the trajectory of the books is interesting because during the Balkan Wars, some books ended up in Bulgaria. Uh, but I think the biggest portion was uh, ended up actually in Egypt. When a commission was sent by King Fuad to retrieve whatever that could be retrieved from Kavala, and they ended up in the National Library of uh, Egypt in the Kutub Khana uh, and later on Dar Kutub. And we have a register of, um, of them. I just want to add one last bit related to books, which is the fact, which is something that I um, I'm intrigued by, and the, my students who are attending who are, will be talking about Waqf. I want you to pay attention to this very interesting detail, which is the fact that the books that were transferred were transferred as Waqf in what sense? It's not just the books themselves became Waqf in the sense that the knowledge that the book books produce the, you know, the, it's like when you have a, a shop that produces income that then the income supports a hospital. Here, the books, the physical books are like the shops. What is it that they produce? They produce knowledge. And it is in that sense, this is why this is couched in a very important ceremony whereby the books are transferred, not just to be donated, to the cases and to be put in the library, but they become what they themselves generate uh, here. And the here that they generate is knowledge. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful uh, way to uh, end uh, the, the, uh, the, the talk and also to make those of us who are involved in uh, the creation um, and dissemination of knowledge feel, feel better about being part of the enterprise we are in. Thank you so much for an excellent talk. There are many other questions that, that people are asking now, but uh, we've taken a lot of your time, well over an hour. So, um, so please, we can have a virtual um, round of applause for our speaker Thank you. Uh, and, and let, him, uh, let him go. Thank you again, Khalid, very, very much. Thank you, Scott. Yes, thank you so much.
Thanks, Bye. Okay. Bye.